PR. We're ready to do what I'm calling lungs three. Three lessons in a row here about lungs. And the first thing I want to do is bring down this kind of funny little picture. And I just want to say up till now we've talked about normal lung function. And of course, if this dog was real, he probably wouldn't be able to sing many songs because he's got all kinds of insulation on him over his fur. And you remember, of course, that dogs lose a lot of their heat by panting. They have to evaporate water in their respiratory tract to get rid of heat. They have really no sweat glands except maybe on the pads of their feet. Anyway, so if everything's working normally, this dog would be breathing fine and be able to sing at least a few songs. But I'd like to talk about some respiratory disorders in uh, this series, in our pets, respiratory disorders. There's hundreds of these disorders, but I've uh, picked out a few ones that I can explain and uh, have some good images that I've gotten. So I'd like to review a little bit with this diagram, this picture we've seen before. It's really pretty good. It shows one alveolus that's got air coming in and going out, inhaled, exhaled, whatever you want to say, inspiration, expiration, in a tidal format, meaning it comes in, goes back the same path. Diffusion is passive, and it has to go across some distance. Some people call that the respiratory membrane. I like to call it the diffusion barrier. It looks like there's air in this space here, but there's not. That's interstitial fluid. And everything has to be very close together because diffusion only happens over microns, very small distances. The blood flows slowly. I think it would take, uh, what, a couple of minutes to go an inch, I've said, capillary flow. So remember that nice little diagram there. I'll just move it off to the side here. Well, lo and behold, this nice diagram, and I'll maybe even enlarge it so we can all see it a little better, has a composite view of what can go wrong. Let's start here in the middle. This is their depiction of the normal uh, bunch of alveoli. When blood comes in, the arterial side, which is blue in this case only, it picks up oxygen and the blood turns brighter red. And so the flow has to be that way. This is a normal. Let's start up here at the 1 o'clock position with abnormal, things that are in a disorder. You can have thickening of the wall. What's wrong with that? Then you make it harder for oxygen to diffuse into the blood, and it makes it harder for carbon, carbon dioxide to go back. That's bad. Increases the thickness of the diffusion barrier, and diffusion is passive, so anything that makes it thicker makes it less efficient. At the 3 o'clock position, pneumonia. We've got fluid in the lumen of the alveolus. How's air, oxygen, going to get diffused into the blood? Not good. Then we have pulmonary edema. Edema is a word meaning a collection of fluid, and in this case, it's in the lumen of the alveolus, again, interrupting the diffusion of oxygen. Going over here at about the 7 o'clock position, this is a beautiful term, interstitial edema. Remember back up here on the left, this is interstitial space. Now I'm up in the far left here. Interstitial space. It's filled with interstitial fluid. If there's too much fluid, that's called edema. What does that do? It makes the diffusion barrier thicker, and therefore it's going to be harder to get oxygen into the blood. And in fact, all these cases, they've never did the right side of the picture in red as they did here. So they're saying this is all decreasing the amount of oxygen to the blood. Here we've got destruction of some of these air sacs. 
That's what emphysema is. There's less air sacs, less surface area for exchange. Overall, that's going to be terrible. You're going to get less oxygen picked up. In the human population, people that have emphysema, I see them sometimes like in the grocery store and so forth, they often have an oxygen tank. Why? Because that's going to make diffusion better because they're breathing in basically, I believe it's pure oxygen, and that's going to enhance diffusion, right? But emphysema, destruction of lung tissue. Then up here at about the 11 o'clock position, we have a alveolar collapse. That means the surfactant isn't present, and it's going to decrease the surface area of all those little sacs. That's terrible. Okay, so let's talk a little more about the collapsed alveoli. This uh, can also be called respiratory distress syndrome, but that's kind of a uh, bad term. Not bad, but respiratory distre distress syndrome means there's something happening where respiration isn't right. And that can be many things, one of which is collapsed alveoli. Collapsed because we don't have enough surfactant. Remember we said in premature babies and probably in our dogs and cats and horses, if they are born premature, they're going to lack surfactant. Now I thought it was interesting, at least in the human population, you can order surfactant. And I just wanted to show you a few bottles and uh, talk about this. Okay, so here's a couple of bottles. It's a brand name. I'm not selling any brands. I'm, I just found those. Here's another one. And I'll point out one of these things here. I like the name, Cervanta. So they start out with Sir, like surfactant, and then they went to Cervanta. And it's basically the same product over here. But I wanted to show you. It's kind of interesting. Here's four mils, a bottle of four mils, and a bottle of eight. Well, I want to tell you four mils is a little less than a teaspoon. A teaspoon is like five mils. So this is a little less than a teaspoon. And this is probably a little maybe more than 1.5 teaspoons. We all know what a teaspoon looks like. Pretty small. Why am I trying to make a point here? Well, this bottle is four to five hundred dollars. And this bottle is probably close to six hundred dollars. So you have less than a teaspoon here for hundreds of dollars. So in the human medicine world, they have this all over and use it. Of course, a physician would know the indications of that. It's not really used much in the animal world. And then the other thing I thought was interesting is there's a whole bunch of these surfactants. And I guess here's a teachable moment for words. This table up here, I just threw up on the right here, put up, not threw up, sorry. I'm going to enlarge it, and I'll even cover that over a little bit because I want to make a point here of some words. <clears throat> Exogenous surfactants. That means coming from the outside of the animal. So premature babies could be administered exogenous surfactants because they lack endogenous surfactants. Maybe I'll spell endogenous here. Usually I don't take the time to spell that, but it's fine. So you can have endogenous surfactants made by the lung tissue. And if the premature baby lacks surfactant, you can administer exogenous surfactants. Now, maybe I should ask you, how do you think you give a premature baby exogenous surfactants? You know, it comes as a liquid. We saw that down here. Would you inject it? IV, sub Q? And all the, answer, the answers to all those questions are no. It has to be put directly down the trachea and into the bronchi. It has to go into the lumen of the alveoli. It has to be coming down here. I'm looking at this picture up in the left. So it has to be administered very carefully. And there's a certain technique I won't go into. But anyway, back to this table. Look at the source of some of this stuff. Bovine, that's cow. 
bovine. I'm going to skip synthetic for a minute. And then porcine, that's pig, by the way. So they can take animal lung tissue and extract surfactant, and they I'm sure I'm sure they do purify it, sterilize it, and maybe add a few other components in there. So this would be called animal origin surfactant, right? If it comes from an animal, at least originally. The synthetic then would be manufactured or produced in a laboratory, synthetic, no animal products uh, included. So I thought that was kind of an interesting little tidbit there. Um, and I, maybe one other thing I wanted to say about surfactant in the premature babies, um, they probably have a tenth of all the surfactant they should have. So it's uh, they are lacking much. It's a little controversial. Not everybody is a pure believer in putting surfactants down the trachea. There's, you know, takes a lot of skill to do that. Not everybody has the right skill. Okay, now we're going to discuss pleural effusion. Remember, this is pulmonary disorders. Here's a nice little figure I found, and I'm going to enlarge this a little bit. Let's see, I'm going to enlarge it a little bit later. Let me explain a few things. The pleura is really a membrane that lines the chest cavity, and I'm over here on this picture, the chest cavity right against the ribs, and then the outer side, outer portion of the lung. So it's like two membranes that are facing each other. There's liquid in between them, but a very small amount. Okay, serous membrane. It's like a wet membrane. There's an outer layer, and then there's a layer right on the lungs. So there's like this space. And the lungs can slide by the rib cage, but separation is very difficult because I don't know if you've ever had two plates of glass. If there's like liquid there, it's very hard to pull them apart, although they can slide easily. The kicker is lungs cling to the thoracic wall, and then when the thoracic volume changes, you can get inspiration. Okay, so there's this plural space, and let me enlarge this picture. Oops, got to do the right thing here. And I'm going to point it out here as they do, they call it the pleural cavity. And it's going to be like this white area, very thin. And I'm over there with the laser pointer on the left lung here. And that's the pleural cavity, or some people call it the pleural space. Now, the point is, when there's too much fluid in that area, you call it pleural effusion. Okay? So let me get rid of that diagram, picture, whatever you want to call it, and show you some real cases. And I guess what I should say is when there's too much fluid in there, this diagram does a nice job of showing that space because there's a pleural membrane here on the outside of the lung and one here against the inner wall of the chest. You can put a needle in there. And if there's plenty of fluid, which only is in a case where there's abnormal fluid, the normal amount of fluid you'd hardly ever be able to get out. It's so thin, you, you wouldn't have this big a space. Anyway, you can draw it out with a syringe. So let me show you that. Well, okay, let me get rid of that. And the term for poking a needle into that space and draining it is thoracentesis. This basically means putting a needle into the thorax. That's what thoracentesis means. So let's look at some of these great pictures that people have provided. And this one shows a needle being inserted in that space in a horse, and it's being taken out with a needle and syringe, and obviously it's not clear. It usually would be clear in a normal case, but when there's this much fluid, then it's abnormal, definitely, by definition. And then I thought I found another picture that was kind of neat. Here's a young woman, probably a vet or vet student, whatever, and she's having a good time. It's a success for her because you can see the smile. She's draining some of that effusion from the pleural cavity, and that's, a, that's not fluid there. That's a tube 
but the tube is hooked to a needle and they're collecting it so it'd be nice to collect it and then get rid of it rather than put it on the floor now we're to another disorder nosebleeds and another way of saying nosebleeds is epistaxis epistaxis is another term for nosebleeds well of course we got some pictures ah there's a horse with a bloody nose I picked on horses because many of the racehorses have nosebleeds after a race let me see if I get another one yeah look at that that's even more blood coming from the nose of the horse let me get it over here side by side so yeah look at that epistaxis nosebleeds when you see blood on the nose the nares maybe that's a term I should help you with their nares are the openings of the nostrils okay there's the nares one two these are harder to see but there's nares there's blood coming out of the nares one thing is you don't know and I got red on red here a little bit but here on the left picture when blood is coming out of the nose you don't know where it's coming from the respiratory tree it could be just a couple inches up here and this one might be having a, some injury or a tumor it could be coming here up further and of course we don't have the rest of the view of the horse it could all, also be coming from any part of the trachea the bronchi even the distant distal lung tissue so you never know where it's really coming from another thing about horses especially if it's after a race or something it's called exercise induced pulmonary hemorrhage now, often abbreviated EIPH exercise induced pulmonary hemorrhage and it's estimated about half the racehorses have this after a race now they may not show blood coming out of the nares but if you look into their trachea you might even find some blood that might not even make it to the outside but about half the horses that's one article I read half the horses have this exercise induced pulmonary hemorrhage after a race or any vigorous exercise okay so we're still talking about respiratory disorders in our pets mostly those couple of horses but you know the decreased surfactant can be from anybody okay this one is a collapsed trachea now we already said the trachea is the windpipe it's made of cartilaginous rings it's always open as opposed to the esophagus which takes food to the stomach that's always closed unless there's swallowing going on very interesting a collapsed trachea is shown on this radiograph and so let me bring that term over to a radiograph is this image I have uh, it's also called an x-ray I'm going to enlarge this and I can cover some of that stuff over that doesn't really matter let me point out the trachea now let me orientate you cranial caudal ventral dorsal we can see the ribs individual ribs coming off the spinal column here's the cervical vertebra that means the vertebra in the neck here is the normal trachea okay so it's this diameter but if you follow it in a cranial mat direction it's collapsed look at uh, it's probably what only 25 percent of what it is here the diameter so you have a collapsed trachea who gets this well it ends up being small dogs get collapsed trachea they might have it from the day they were born they might develop it later or any place in between but it's most common in small breeds like let's see the Maltese pugs Pomeranians Yorkies Chihuahuas 
something like that. That's a collapsed trachea. Not good. Cuts down on the breathing. Big dogs hardly ever, ever get this. I'm finishing up respiration here, and I wanted to say something about oxygen. <clears throat> excuse me, oxygen masks for dogs and cats. I'm bringing this up because every once in a while in the news you hear a house has burned, there were pets in the house, they got rescued, but they're not breathing or they're lacking oxygen. And this is kind of my public service thing here. Maybe think about checking with your local fire department that they do have oxygen masks. Here's a dog with an oxygen mask on. They fit over the muzzle and they have like a rubber gasket. You put the dog or cat's muzzle in here and then the oxygen would be hooked up. The neat thing about most of these, and you can always make sure this is the case, that these masks for dogs and cats fit on the same equipment that's used for humans. So there's no other equipment necessary except the mask because the plumbing would fit on to the plumbing that already exists that the fire department has. So here is a picture of three different sizes of oxygen masks, three different sizes of that rubber gasket because then you can see a smaller dog. You can't see the opening very well here, but you can see this would be a small dog, medium dog, bigger dog. And they are flexible because they don't they can fit on the muzzle here you'd still get good ventilation or back even further so each mask has a range in the size of the animal it gets but the plumbing is the same that hooks up to the human equipment so that's my public service uh, announcement does your local fire department have masks for dogs and cats